This is Dr. David Pomeroy, your host on ADHD Focus. I wanted to remind you that the show is not intended to be a recommendation for diagnosis or treatment of any condition for any specific person. Please consult your mental health professional or doctor managing your ADHD or mental health issues about any diagnosis or treatment related information that you hear on the show. Refer your ADHD provider to the show if he or she would like more information. Thank you. And today I have um, one of the two experts in the field of ADHD whom I've been privileged to meet and talk with at various conferences. Dr. Thomas Brown is a Yale trained clinical psychologist specializes in the assessment and treatment of ADHD and related problems in children, adolescents, and adults. He served on the clinical factory at, faculty at Yale Medical School for 25 years and then relocated to Manhattan Beach, California to open the Brown Clinic for Attention and Related Disorders. He is also a clinical professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the University of California Riverside Medical School. Dr. Brown has published 30 peer-reviewed journal articles and written seven books on ADHD, his latest one on Asperger's and ADHD. Tom, it's a privilege to have you on the program. David, I, I feel honored to be invited back, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk with you. Um, and I'm not sure I had the title right on your latest book about ADD and Asperger's. Has that been published yet? Or Yes. Uh, the title of it is ADHD and Asperger's Syndrome in Smart Kids and Adults. And then the subtitle is 12 Stories of Struggle, Support, and Treatment. Great. Um, and that's basically what we'll be talking about today. Um, and I, in one of your webinars, you made uh, the distinction between Asperger's and the autism spectrum disorder, which now, according to the DSM-3, they're rolled together. Um, yeah, they did get put together. And I think, it was, frankly, I think it was a mistake. Uh, that, that's one of the things I argued in that book on ADHD and Asperger's. It's not a main theme of the book, but I did say that uh, I think that the needs and uh, the abilities of people that we call Asperger's syndrome, uh, which is you know one way of thinking of it, is sort of the higher IQ end of the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. If you think about the autism spectrum, there, there's autism where uh, you have somebody who barely has any language. Right. And who has a lot of difficulties, even with you know basic motor skills and such. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this spectrum that goes up all the way to people who have very high IQs, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, do have some difficulties in terms of reading emotions and, and getting along with other people. And so I felt like it was useful to have the, the separate category of Asperger's syndrome as sort of a subset of yeah. people uh, you know, on the autism spectrum, uh, just to recognize that these are people who have different strengths and different problems as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I agree with you that uh, I wouldn't, when I'm thinking of um, people I see, many of whom are programmers, um, and that's often a strength of theirs to mm -hmm. have that hyper-focus. I wouldn't think of them as being in the autism spectrum. Uh, so yeah, I, it, I think it they're is, yeah. very, very different in, in their strengths and also in their needs. Mm -hmm. So how does Asperger show up in children? Is it different than adults? And these are people not yet diagnosed. Yeah, the things that you, you hear about uh, you know, in terms of, of the, the sort of what the kids are like uh, is that they often are, you know, if, if it's going to be somebody that we would be likely to think of as Asperger's syndrome, uh, that usually means they've got at least average smarts mm -hmm. and very often quite a bit above average smarts. 
but they, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of ways of looking at it. One is to uh, look at how people describe their kids who may be in that category. And I have one example I was uh, thinking of. Uh, this is a, a, a kid uh, that I saw when he was 11 years old. And he, uh, what he said to me is, uh, I'm in school to work ahead and to get to college faster where I can be around others who are very smart like I am, hmm. and who will share my interest in music and theoretical physics. I don't have friends at this school. I'm lonely there. The other kids aren't like me, but at least I'm not getting bullied like I was in my last school. Mm -hmm. I used to be pretty depressed and had thoughts of suicide, but that's been better recently. I still worry, though, about what it'll be like if I'll meet my goal to skip ahead to a higher grade. And then when I asked him to tell me a little more about this, he said, I'm a nerd who's in school to work ahead. I get along better with grown-ups and older kids than with kids my age. I don't have any mm -hmm. friends at school. I'm lonely there. I want to get into high school as, as an 11-year-old as soon as possible and then get into college where I'll be with other people very smart like I am. Uh, when I get there, I want to major in theoretical physics and minor in law or business. I've always had trouble focusing on anything for long. I've always had depression and has had some thoughts of suicide. I've had also migraines. I'm germphobic. I wash my hands until they're red and raw. I also fidget a lot with my feet. You know, so you can see that he's a very articulate kid. Yes. But you can imagine how that uh, that makes it a lot more difficult in getting along with other kids mm -hmm. and doesn't have a sense of how talking the way he is, where he places himself way above all the other kids, uh, is, is likely to turn off kids. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, another source of, of uh, another way of trying to answer the question of, how are people who have Asperger's, uh, you know, how do they show up in, in childhood? There's a study that uh, Baron Cohen did. You know, he's a Brit who's written on this. And he had a bunch of Asperger's adults and got them to talk a little bit about what they were like when they were kids. Uh, uh -huh. And some of the things they mentioned were they tend to be loners. They don't know much about how to interact with other kids their age. Mm hmm they remember themselves as preferring to talk with adults that they didn't get very often invited to play at a classmate's home or even to birthday parties. Uh, another one had said uh, that I wasn't much into social pretend play. I was more focused on building things or reading factual books. Mm -hmm. Another one uh, you know, was saying, well, I think I'm like a lot of my friends who have Asperger's. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we have very intellectual interests to high levels. We like to learn facts. And most of us are really very knowledgeable, at least on a few specific subjects. Right, right. And often that's all they'll talk with you about. Mm -hmm. and, but the other thing was a lot of them said that when they were in school, it was a problem because they were really smart and could get a lot of the things that needed to be done for their schoolwork. But often they wouldn't hand in some of the schoolwork. Uh, even though they understood the stuff and could pass a good test on it, the homework wasn't getting in, and some were failing academic subjects. Yeah, I wonder whether some of those kids are basically bored. I mean, that some of them probably are. something in math, and okay, I get it. Why do I have to do twelve yeah, problems? Yeah, why, why should I have to bother doing these problems? Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, and then why should I have to bother turning in the homework? Because yeah, uh, why should I no have to bother either. going to school in, in sixth grade when I'm ready to go to 10th grade? Right, right. And that's that's an even tougher social jump. Um, it, it is. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I've I've heard adults um, specifically, or I could say I'd, thinking back on patients where the factual books, factual things are where their interest is not um yeah and often they're very good with mm -hmm. not one place the fantasy type thing may come up is with video games yes because um, many of and i don't know enough about them to know whether there's some multiplayer ones that are intellectual or whether they'd be 
loners in that. Some of them are very challenging, and they can often find other kids who are very bright and very mm -hmm. good at doing those games. Yeah, and uh, if if their work is boring, then they're more likely to fall into the games. Then it gets into the sure. kind of same thing. Why do the homework? As in, right. why do there, my there, there job are some, work? There are some schools that have programs for their higher IQ kids. Not mm -hmm. all have Asperger's, but uh, you know the the kids who can do more, and they try and provide more opportunities to do things that'll be interesting to them. Yeah, but a lot of of schools, it's not that easy to do that, and to also cater the needs of the many other students who have different needs. Yeah, there's one school here in Bellevue, Washington, that uh, is more project based. Mm -hmm. So instead of the classroom learning and lectures, they're doing projects on. Yeah, and for some students that works very well. Mm -hmm. At least for some of the curriculum. So some of the things you described in this 11-year-old would fit into um, ADHD kind of things. Can't say That's right. Them. And there's a very high percentage of kids and adults who have Asperger's who also have ADHD. Mm -hmm. Is that on the order of 50%? Uh, it depends on which study you look at yeah. and how they're measuring it. But uh, all I can tell you is I, I think that we're talking about something that's closer to 75% than it is to 50%. Oh. Um, so what are some of the common things that ADHD and Asperger's share in terms of uh, whether it's symptoms or uh, abilities? Well, I think that the people with, uh, I think it's important to, to uh, mention that uh, among those with Asperger's, there are a lot of different personalities. Mm -hmm. It's not like there's just one, uh, you know, picture that that uh, matches all of them. Uh, you know, the, 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 in terms of personality, there there's some of them who are, are kind of arrogant, know-it-all types mm -hmm. among those with Asperger's, but there are also some others who are uh, kind of fearful and kind of avoidant and clingy. To adults, uh, there's some of them who uh, act like uh, little adults and are trying to take care of everybody else. Yeah. Sometimes to boss other people around, uh, and others are are kind of fragile and and uh, you know also perfectionistic, and uh, mm -hmm. many of them get into being rule enforcers. So it's like mm -hmm. they identify with the adult in the room rather than with the other kids of the same age. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my point is just that uh, it's it's not like there's just one personality type uh, among people with Asperger's, but what they what they have in common is that they can be extremely bright and often have a lot of factual information about uh, particular areas that they're interested in. Right. But they tend to be often kind of clueless in terms of social interaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that... Uh, gets to be you know you know pretty problematic and it gets on the nerves of other kids and uh as a result then often the other kids are, are going to just uh you know sort of push back and and uh try but here's size them this is a uh a little piece of uh that i'd written down about uh a boy who was 12 years old and uh he was his name is sam the parents talking and and uh, your mom said, uh, you know, Sam's doing okay in his schoolwork, but he gets teased a lot, and he makes trouble for himself by being too critical of other kids. Yeah, yeah despite what we tell him, he can't keep his opinions to himself. He's always quick to point out when another kid makes a mistake, not only during classes but also in practices and games with his baseball and basketball teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He starts middle school in two months, and we're really concerned about how he's going to get along socially there. Yeah, I think that the kind of intersection of the a lot of factual knowledge and um, a black and white thinking that yeah. hey, this is the way it, it is, mm -hmm. um, so how come you aren't doing it that way? That's what the rules are, and that's the way it should be done. Yeah, and the thing that, that's missing there, of course, is 
a sense of how what they're saying is likely to be received by the other kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, uh, most kids uh, who don't have Asperger's are going to be able to, they may not always pay attention to it, but they can tell when another kid is going to get angry or annoyed or retaliate if you start uh, acting like you're the adult telling them what to do. Yeah, yeah. And maybe and, a couple of times that happens and then they learn from that experience. And right, yeah. But they're thinking, they're, well, I know you're not doing it right, but I'm going to yeah, let but, that go. But they don't have to open their mouth and, and uh, start acting like they're the ones who are supposed to tell people what they should do and what they're not doing. Mm hmm um, you know, now, it's not like every kid who does that has Asperger's. Right, right. You know, but that, those are a couple of the, the, the characteristics you see sometimes with Asperger's kids. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of one man who's now in his early 30s, and uh, he had played soccer, and he's just totally into soccer he knows players in the premier league and la liga and all these other mm -hmm. different international ones um and he's a referee yeah um and boy he knows exactly the rules of um one thing or another i'll be watching a game with him and say why was that a foul and bingo it's almost like he can recite the rule book he probably can <laughs> yeah he probably is coming up exactly with that language um, which is a, a good um, way to be because nobody can argue with him on the field. Um, well, they, they, but they also don't have to like him very much. Right, right. It's that what he says goes, and that's and it, it is. You know, if you're playing on a, a kid's soccer team and the ref is that way, you don't have to like him, uh, but you, it doesn't pay to argue with him much or you're going to get yourself thrown out of the game. Yeah, yeah. However, if it's parents. another kid who's acting like they are the referee or they are the coach, yes. they're the ones that's criticizing, the one who is criticizing you, uh, there are ways kids have of getting back to kids who do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And often you end up with, uh, you know, the kid who's being excessively critical, getting mm -hmm. um, dealt with kind of harshly or just isolated. Now, how, how does... Uh... What's the percentage, would you say, of girls with Asperger's, or has that even been well? There, there are not much very many studies that have really nailed that down. But the fact mm -hmm. is, there are uh, there are, there are some. Uh, I think that we're we're probably talking about maybe a quarter to a, th a third of the people with Asperger's uh, are are girls mm -hmm. or females. Right. Um, uh, and they have some very similar traits, but often are, uh, you know, they're they're smart and they often show that off a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I I think many I think it tends to be girls than boys who have ADHD may not have the Asperger's part um, are very perfectionistic. It yeah, seems to be just so, and I'm speculating whether this is as they were in their younger years they're always told oh you're wrong this and that mm -hmm. and they're convinced okay if i'm perfect i can't be criticized yeah um and i'll have to uh think back on some of my patients in terms of okay how does this maybe look into the perfectionist uh, area and there certainly are girls that are loners and and uh fit many of those things they'd rather be talking with adults and yes mm -hmm. they can carry on very intellectual conversations um so are there some co-occurring conditions um that tend to run along with one or the other that are common i'm thinking of anxiety which in my experience is almost central to Asperger's and autism. Um, yeah, uh, uh, that's true. And of course, we see elevated rates of anxiety in, in people with ADHD, too. Mm -hmm. If you think about in a general population of kids 
uh, you usually find it, it's about 5% would really qualify for a diagnosis of, of uh, anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. and, it's about, and among kids uh, who have ADHD, it's about 35%. Yeah, a little over There's the, the uh the aspect of Asperger's, which is a, uh, and maybe it's, um, I'd like your opinion on whether it is as prominent in those people to have um, an anxiety because they're so sensitive to stimulation. They get overwhelmed by light sound noise and yeah you know. there that's that's true not in all people with Asperger's syndrome uh but uh but in many and sometimes it's it's uh you know too much input if like if uh there are some of them who like loud music like many other teenagers do mm -hmm. uh, but there are also some who uh don't like anything that's loud they don't like uh a lot like flashing lights or even mm -hmm. things like the the tab in the back of a shirt that they're, yeah. that they're kind of touchy uh, and, ab about uh, stimuli that that uh, are Im impacting on them that they don't really want. So you end and, up sometimes with parents having to cut the labels out of the back of the of the shirts or uh, yeah, and I think that uh, tends to be present in kids with ADHD too, particularly yeah. the texture or of clothes even of foods that's uh, right and that can be and you can see that with ADHD and you can see it also with Asperger's syndrome and and I know there's more seems to be more publicity about not just um, eating disorders anorexia but uh, this avoidance avoidance restriction of food uh, which seems to have a basis in the texture or color and those kinds of things. Yeah. And maybe more present in autism. I I don't think of that as specifically so much with ADHD. No, but uh, you do get it with, with some people have ADHD and you get, get it with uh, some people have Asperger's syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, there among those people on the spectrum, uh, the autism spectrum, there are a lot more people who are, you know, up in the at least average smarts range mm -hmm. than not. You know, so that that uh, you know, I think they, there's been a, a real need for and, and, and a successful effort to provide. Uh, more adequate education and, re and support for uh, kids on the autism spectrum who are lower functioning, mm -hmm. don't have much language and who, who have a lot of difficulties in coordinating uh, physical movements and so forth. But, um, but that's really a minority yeah. of people on yeah. the autism spectrum. And mm -hmm. it, it goes, you know, you know, it genuinely is a spectrum. Right. And I, I think, uh, you know, certainly when I was in medical school and early practice, when someone mentioned autism, the picture I had, and I think many people had, was a three-year-old who regressed in language, now really can't function on his own yeah. feeding or anything else. Um, and much like ADHD, that which I think in the... Uh, 1980s and 90s was hyperactive eight-year-old boys. Right, exactly. That's where it, was, it wasn't uh, recognized that the diversity of, of cognitive abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, in people with ADHD, and in uh, the the emphasis was very much on on just the high, for for years, for decades, it, it was just referred to as hyperness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the hyper, hyper kids, and you know. Those were uh, the ones that we uh, gradually have learned to see as, as the ones who have ADHD. And, and the model of ADHD, which, which I use and have written about quite a bit, uh, is one where you can write a, basically write an equation that says ADHD equals 
impaired executive function. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. the management system of the brain. Right. The model I work with has in it half a dozen different components. There, there's being able to get organized and get started on one mm -hmm. thing. On one thing, there's being able to focus and then shift focus when you need to focus. Yes. Yes. And then there's also uh, it's not in the DSM criteria, but the model that I and a number of other people are are using also includes regulating alertness, which is being able to. Uh, get to sleep when you need to sleep and be awake when you need to be awake. Right. And, and sleep uh, is... being able to sustain effort. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, be uh, with it. You know, being able to, to I, I'm thinking about a, a, a kid who said, uh, my mind is a great sprinter, but it's a lousy you know, distance runner. Yeah. And if whatever I'm going to do is something you do quickly in one chunk and you just go all out for it and then you're done with it quickly. I'm mm -hmm. fine, but something where you can't do it in one quick chunk, you have to keep chipping yeah. away at it day after day. So that I have a lot more trouble with, and many people right. with PhD uh, say the same. And then there's also a processing speed thing that many people who are quite bright who have ADHD also uh, are, are kind of slow. And you know, for example, they may if you ask them to uh, to write an, an essay or several paragraphs about something. Often they've got some very good ideas about what to do, but it takes them half or forever to get the sentences and paragraphs out. Yeah, yeah. And so what's that the... kind of thing? And then the uh, fourth of the of the uh, six clusters uh, in the model that I work with for ADHD has to do with managing emotions. Yeah, that's you know, a big that one. many times people with ADD struggle, and it's different things for different people. There are some mm -hmm. people where they. Uh, They've got a, a short fuse, you know. For example, yeah. talking with a, a, a guy the other day who it, it was at, a, he said, "I was in the, in the diner having lunch. I'm in a pretty good mood. Sitting eating my sandwich. Guy in the booth behind me gets his sandwich. He's chewing too loud. He's going chomp, chomp, chomp on every bite. He said there was something about that noise that was driving me nuts. It was as though a computer virus had gotten into my head, and and just that's all I could think about. And he said, "I'm sitting there with my fist clenched, seriously." thinking about getting up and smacking this guy in the mouth because he was chewing so obnoxiously loud. He said, I didn't do it. I didn't want to get arrested. Mm -hmm. if I went home, I would have been yelling at somebody who would have walked out of the room. He said, but then after a few minutes, it passed. Yeah, and I've and said, heard of uh, people with ADHD um, saying, I would yell at my sister because she's chewing her mashed potatoes too loudly. Yeah, right. <laughs> the mashed potatoes. And the same kind of thing. They get that in their head and they can't get that out. Yeah. And um, that, and that, yeah, but, it, and there are other emotions too. There, there's some people yeah. with ADD who have a lot of trouble not, not managing their anger, but uh, managing their worry. Yeah. They're constantly freaking out about, oh, this is going to be terrible. This isn't going to work. And then other people who who get uh, really very sad very quickly, and they give up. They, the minute it looks like there's there's one cloud on the horizon, they're assuming that we better cancel the picnic. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, I think of it as a kind of a variation of anxiety. Yeah, the worry. Well, it is, yeah, and it's, then they shut down because exactly. Oh, that's too difficult. But man, managing emotions is is a, a, a thing which is a problem for all of us sometimes. But among people with ADHD, that uh, they're not all having trouble with the same emotions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's it's the hurt feelings. I was talking with a businessman, you know, last month, and he was telling me about how he's walking down the hall at work. And a friend of his who worked in the other department was was walking by, is looking at some papers as he's walking, and he uh, hadn't seen him for a while, so he stopped and said, "Hi, how how you doing?" Uh, and the, the friend looked up from his papers and said, "Hi," and kept right on walking. Mm -hmm. And he said, all day I kept thinking that I'd do something to piss him off. Or right, I, right. I wasn't, you know, it didn't occur to him that maybe he was on his way to a meeting where he had to do something about those papers. Yeah, yeah, and he was yeah, intended his, reviewing his them. His feelings were hurt, and he was just you know thinking about it all day. So there are different ways of uh, with with different emotions. Some people uh, get scared. Uh, I was talking with a woman uh, about a month ago, 
and she was saying, I'm, I'm on the left side of the freeway, and I'm in, in the, le the le left lane, and next to me in the next lane over, there's this huge semi. And she said, I was looking at it, and I have the, she said, I have this thing of what if, that yeah. sometimes, I'm, so I'm looking at this semi, and we're going about 65 miles an hour, both he and I. And I know that he can't see me because he's way up at the front and I'm back in the middle of about the, the length of this very long uh, truck. And uh, so he has to look at me through his mirrors and I'm wondering, does he have his mirrors set right? Can, can right. he see and me? He's looking and she's some. thinking yeah. about uh, if he doesn't see me, he could just decide he wants to get in this lane and come over and squish my car. And pretty soon I'm not just thinking about it as the possibility. She said, I'm running a very vivid movie in my head, imagining exactly what it would look like if that truck mm -hmm. came over and smashed into my car. And then the truck jackknifed and cars and trucks were hitting us repeatedly. Massive traffic jam takes a long time to get the rescue squad and cut me out of the car. By that time, I bled to death. I have to call my family and tell them I'm dead and all this. Well, I'm trying to drive the car 65 miles an hour down the road. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's just a different type of, of emotion. Right. And uh, I've but it heard different ones, for different people. Yeah. And patients, I think of one woman that was talking about that exact same thing and was finding it happening so often in different situations that she's scared to drive. Mm -hmm. um, saying, I, I don't know whether I'm going to react in the wrong way because I'm. Yes, about all this. Exactly. And am I going to try to get away or all of a sudden take an exit or whatever? Um, so she said, it's better if I don't even drive. Right. And that that's a, a, a sort of being overwhelmed with a fear. Right. Right. It and can be helpful be if you've got enough fear about it to be careful. Right. Right. But not mm -hmm. so much that you get you know, gobbles up all the space in your head. Mm -hmm. And maybe the the fear is overriding the thought of absolutely you know i could just slow down yep and not have to worry absolutely. about being right next to him and then another piece of add besides difficulty with regulating emotion is memory if you ask people who have add how's your memory I often say oh, i've got the best memory of my family i remember stuff nobody else could remember they give us an example about some movie they saw five years ago Mm -hmm. And they can tell you every detail of the entire storyline of that movie that they saw five years ago. Haven't seen it since. Uh, but then if you ask them about, uh, you know, other things that they remember, they'll, they'll tell you, you know, I, all the time I'm walking into rooms thinking, what the hell did I come in here for? Yeah. Like downstairs mm -hmm. to get something you need for a project you're working on, see something else that's interesting or something else that needs doing. And soon you're up to your elbows in project number two. I mean, totally forgot you were in the middle of project number one upstairs was kind of important to get it done. Right, right. I've... So it, that short term working memory is the big thing, because some people with ADD have very good long term memory. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, they have a lot of trouble just remembering what you just said or what they were about to do. And yeah, keeping the focus memory. on what you're doing now so that you can continue with it. Yeah. And like you say, go into another room or go open the refrigerator looking for something and then, oh, and you see something totally different and then yep. take that out. Um, and yeah, well, that, that short-term working memory problem is a big piece of, of ADHD for a lot of people who have it. Is there a good way to test working memory and processing speed that is not just a kind of one-on-one -on -one in a neuropsychological evaluation where you're being asked to remember numbers forward and back, which to me doesn't seem a very practical application of working memory. No, I'll tell you the one that I use when I'm doing evaluations is a, a thing that's part of the Wexler memory scale. I don't use the whole damn thing. It's a big, long test, but they have two stories. Each one has about 25 word units in it. Ah, okay. And I'll just say, uh, I'm going to read you two short stories. Each one's just a paragraph. Please listen carefully. And then after I finish reading this story, I'm going to stop and ask you to tell it back to me as close to the same words as you can. I, I'm not saying that I, I don't want just a summary of it. I'm asking for you mm -hmm. to try and remember the words that you've heard. Mm -hmm. So you read the first one. 
and then you ask them to tell you know, tell you as, as, as much as they can remember. And then you read the second one, do the same thing. And then you do some other things for about 10 minutes. And then okay. after that, you say, remember those two stories I read to you? Now, please tell me what you can still remember from the first story. And uh, then get it down. And then now tell me, please, what you can still remember from the, from the second story. And these are the test is norms. So you can look up if you're dealing with somebody who's mm -hmm. 23 or somebody who's 35 or somebody who's 68. Uh, and compare with other people of the same age and say, okay, well, how well is their short-term working memory for those two little stories? And it doesn't tell you everything. No, but it's but it, it more can give you practical. some idea of how they're stacking up against other people the same age. And I think also um, more applicable to a testing situation. Yeah. Where someone has to read a story. I don't. I don't think I would have passed math if we had word problems. Um, <laughs> I'm great with numbers, but trying to figure out the word problem and it, um, sometimes the, the worst is figuring. Okay, well, what numbers do I actually need to use for solving? This? Yes, yes. And how do we plug the numbers into the words? Yes. Um, so, do people ever? conflate the two stories such that when they're oh yeah telling about the second one they're including details from the first often yeah and often if they're doing that very much uh in those two stories it's likely they're going to be doing it in uh, other things they're interacting with people about sure sure but that uh yeah that that issue of working memory is another piece of of uh an important piece i think of adhd oh yeah and then also controlling action. Now, there's some people where they're, even as adults, they're kind of hyper and, and talking fast and moving fast and can't sit still and can't shut up. Uh, but there are also other people where it's not that they are constantly hyperactive as they're old, as they get in their teen years, years or adult years, uh, but sometimes they're impulsive. Mm -hmm. I was talking with somebody the other day, and he said it, it, at work, there's this woman, uh, who works with us and she's really nice so all of us like her and she's a good worker and she's fun to be around and uh, she came up to me and she had this bright colored uh, multicolored blouse on and she had this big smile on her face and and I said do you like my new blouse i just got it and i he said i was preoccupied with other things i, I didn't think about what i was saying but I, I just said well i don't know i'm not sure those colors look good on you Oh, and he said, as soon as the words were out of my mouth, I knew that was not the right answer to her question. Mm -hmm. But yeah. and, uh, there's no reason on earth why I had to be critical about the blouse. I could very easily have just said, it looks really nice. and I love the color or something like that. But um, it was a situation where I just spoke without thinking about what I was saying and who I was talking to. Yeah. And now, I did not want to hurt her feelings. Uh but there was no reason why I had to, to say anything negative like that. And, and is that I think, different than the, I guess, social awkwardness of Asperger's? Yeah, well, I think that Asperger's, that's, that's a good question. I think that, that there's similarities in that often people with Asperger's are not very good at uh, sizing up how other people are going to respond to what they're doing. Mm-hmm. With this guy, it was an unusual response. Yeah, it was just it kind of bingo hit. first thing. But uh, many times with Asperger's, uh, you know, they'll be monopolizing a conversation and not read the signals that several other people in the conversation are getting kind of antsy and wish they could have mm -hmm. a chance to talk to. Or that they uh, sometimes will will be uh, too quick to to respond to things. Mm -hmm. without bothering to listen to what the other person's trying to say. So there's a a difference in the the person with ADHD who commented on the the blouse. It was just not didn't even have a thought about what he was saying. And yeah, so, that was impulsive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it he wasn't somebody who uh who was gen gen generally uh, thoughtless in terms of interacting with other people. 
Mm -hmm. Whereas that, uh, you know, sometimes, well, like that one example I read earlier about the little boy who had Asperger's, who was uh, critiquing, uh, you know, and I've seen a number of them like this. Uh, he was on a, a little league team. And um, anytime somebody came back having struck out, he would explain to him what was wrong with the, with his batting stance. Yeah, that's, or, that'll really get you. Uh, yeah, and, and it, it's the kind of thing where is, he's just, in his mind, he's just giving them some helpful advice. Yeah, feedback. yeah. No. Uh, and assuming you no want to be able to, to the do fact that. that this kid who just struck out is feeling disappointed and hurt and uh, had wished that he was going to be able to hit a decent ball. And um, it, he, the, the Asperger's person often has difficulty in, in with empathy, mm -hmm. with being able yeah. to put themselves in somebody else's shoes and taking that into account in the way that they interact with them. So um, I want to move on to uh, therapy in, in both medication, but also are there different approaches in terms of types of what might be called interpersonal therapy, cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy, play therapy, maybe at, at particular ages. Um, and let's start with the medication because I think that's what a lot of people identify, certainly with treatment of ADHD. Well, yeah, and that's because eight out of 10 people who have ADHD usually respond pretty well mm -hmm. to the medicines we have for it. You know, and the medicines that we have, as you well know, um, cure for AD, the medicines we have for ADD cure nothing. It's not like you have yeah. a, you take an antibiotic and it knocks out the infection. It's more like right. eyeglasses. I have a problem mm -hmm. with my eyes. I can't read typewriter size print without my glasses. Put these glasses on. I, I read it as well as anybody can. Take them off. I'm right back where I started. The glasses don't fix my eyes. They help right. me when I've right. got them off. And in the same way, the medicines we have to offer for ADHD don't cure the problems of ADD, but if you've got an effective dose, um, and it, it, most people, you're going to be able to get something where they're going to be able to compensate for some of those ADHD difficulties. Mm -hmm. uh, to slow down a little more if they need to slow down, or speed up a little more if they need to speed up, or being able to get going on things that they've been putting off, stuff like that. Now, but the, the thing that I think a lot of people run into is that uh, many physicians, and prescribers uh, who are trying to pro provide medicine for people with ADD haven't had uh, enough uh, training to recognize that the amount of medicine, which is going to be an effective dose for a person with ADD, doesn't go much by how old you are or how much no. you weigh or how severe your symptoms are. It's how sensitive right. your body to that particular medicine. Right, right. And so as a, you, know, you know that well, and I know that. Uh, but I know that there are a lot of docs who just figure, well, there's so many medicines you can prescribe according to, you know, how old is the person, how big is the person. And yeah, or they read the book and oh, 20 milligrams ought to be good. And yeah, we, exactly. That really needs five. Yeah. And and you know, so it usually works best to to start with a baby size dose and then just mm -hmm. titrate it a little step by step to find that sweet spot between too little and too much. And I found with particularly maybe with more severely affected kids, more toward the autism side, not quite so up to Asperger's, but even people with Asperger's, that a very low dose. Uh, yes. They're very sensitive. You're so. absolutely right on that. Many of them have very sensitive body chemistries. Mm -hmm. And so you, you want to start very low. And, and then uh, just gradually taper it up and see if you can find that sweet spot between too little and too much. Yeah, I recall one um, kid, I think he's 17 now, and he was probably seven or eight when I started to see him. And it was evident that anxiety was a big part of uh, mm -hmm. his thing. So rather than even giving him five milligrams of Acetalopram, Lexapro, um, and partly because he could he couldn't take pills yet. Right. He, he got liquid, and we started at three milligrams. Yeah. And little by little, that worked up. Mom would say, "Well, 
now it's it's doesn't seem to be working as well so we inch it up right and he's taking 20 milligrams and it's fine yeah um, well it but, takes a while to get you know with with the the ssris particularly mm -hmm. you know, it just takes a while for the medicine to uh get in there long enough you know talking about two three four weeks sometimes before you can see what it's yeah doing, yeah obviously. and then uh with yeah. him saying okay let's go with three milligrams yeah and it was a month um she said our household's different. He's not. Yeah, but tapering it up time. like you did with them was, a, a, I think, a perfect way to to try to deal with that sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, starting way lower than one might think. Very low, and then taking a little bit at a time and seeing what you can do. But it's very true that many people with ADHD and some people with, uh, uh, well, many people with autism spectrum and um, and many people actually with ADHD have a lot of trouble with anxiety. Mm -hmm. and some of them, if you give them stimulants, it does yep. help. You know, it, it's not always the case that uh, the stimulants make people more anxious, but sometimes right. it does. Yeah. And yeah. I've had some people who responded pretty well to stimulants and, and the, their chronic anxiety was uh, less a problem. But then there's some people mm -hmm. who really do need to get into uh, yeah, something, something for the anxiety else, and you don't want well, to be using uh you know fast acting anti-anxiety agents because those are too easy to get to use them too much right right and so Absolutely. usually you're better off with a, a smaller dose of, of, of an ssri, uh, SSRI. Yeah. and i think that's almost an advantage of the adhd medicines that you can see the effect of those very quickly that's right and, and be able to say, no, nope, we have to pull back. Mm -hmm. SSRI may take three, four, or five weeks to really. Yeah, see. which is why you have to taper it in. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, are there some symptoms or characteristics of Asperger's, which the stimulants, ADHD medications, uh, do not address? Well, the. The ADD medicines aren't necessarily going to help them to be able to uh, sort of read other people's emotions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very well um, because they're making two judgments too fast. Yeah, yeah. And so sometimes, rather than you know just depending upon the stimulus, you try you want to do it the simple way first. You know, and, and if you've got somebody who has ADHD that's giving them a lot of trouble. And on top of that, they have Asperger's, which is giving them a lot of trouble. Uh, you want to treat the ADHD first. Right, right. Because which for is... one thing, the medicines that we use for ADHD, you can usually see pretty quickly whether you've got something or you haven't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that approach makes good sense. But then once you could get that stabilized, then if it looks like they're they're too anxious or 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 too depressed mm -hmm. uh, or yeah. or too worried uh, then you may very much uh, very you know really have a need for adding you know one of the ssris to try to to help them with it yeah how about in therapy approaches and i um certainly with adhd need the stimulant so then they can pay attention to what's going on in there. Oh, yeah. But that, um, and there's some people who need the stimulants only for certain activities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For example, there's some kids who need it for homework, but they don't need it when they're in a classroom. Other mm -hmm. kids who definitely need it in the classroom and for homework. Yeah, they're so distracted. And yeah. Um, and so the, the, that, that varies. But then... Uh, you know, when you're dealing with the, the, the kid with Asperger's, those issues are usually, uh, you, you, particularly if you're dealing with, with anxiety, uh, you don't want to be depending on short acting. No, anxiety no, medication no. And because it, you can end up with them getting hooked on them. Yeah. So does cognitive behavioral therapy help someone with Asperger's, for instance, where they can get an awareness of, oh, maybe I could phrase that differently or. Um, well, it can, you know, the, but I, I think often uh, there's so many different examples that they're running into. 
cognitive behavioral stuff works much better when you're dealing with a fairly simple behavior, like being able to keep your butt on the chair in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And you can set up a reinforcement schedule to be able to get that to work out pretty well. But um, I think a lot of the work that that um, we have to do with, with people with Asperger's is didactic work, where mm -hmm. you 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 know, get them to tell you about the uh, incidents that they've been involved in. Where uh, I was, uh, I was, I was just thinking about it. Uh, the same kid who had, had, was giving too much advice to uh, the other people playing a baseball team was was also playing basketball, and he was doing the same damn thing with the basketball team, and. Mm -hmm. The kid, the kids were were really busting his stones, uh, you know, quite a bit yeah. in terms of any little thing he was doing out of line. They certainly pointed it out to him, and he went, you know, crying to his mother, saying, "These kids are being so mean to me." And his mother uh, said, "Hey, look, you know, there's something you don't realize, and that is that." you often telling people what they've done wrong or what they should do better mm -hmm. in playing basketball uh, makes them embarrassed and yeah. makes them angry because they, they made... feel bad enough that they didn't make the basket or that they yeah. lost the ball when they were trying to dribble up there and shoot. Um, and so you've got to watch it. You know, and this is mm -hmm. the kind of thing I'm talking about didactic. It, it's a matter of trying to get them to uh, recognize the situations in which they tend to do things which are going to be, uh, you know, annoying to other people. And catching and, them in their own behaviors yeah. is going to be more relatable. Right. And get them, and get them on the yeah. spot. Yeah. Yeah. And see, oh, um, and I, I think, and I'm thinking of one young man who uh, is one of the tougher um, people to try to figure out what to approach first because he does the correcting, but then even if he's explaining something he did and you try to point that out, he goes into proving why he's right. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's a pretty good way to get other people pissed off. Yeah, yeah, and it it he doesn't he doesn't get it even if his parents explain to him um it's just he's nope convinced he's right and yeah and so you have true. to wait for an opportunity when he's complaining about the fact of how people are treating him mm -hmm. and help him to recognize that it, it's you know a lot of that stuff is paybacks for the time you were criticizing other people yeah yeah it goes both ways yeah and most kids pick it up pretty carefully just by observation. Mm -hmm. But in the case of somebody uh, with Asperger's, uh, often uh, it's harder for them to be able to, to catch on. Yeah. So the same yeah. problem keeps happening again and again. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, been a great discussion. And Tom, I so much appreciate your time. And um, thanks, David. I really enjoy this. talking with you. And uh, I hope we have a chance to talk again sometime soon. Yeah, I'm sure. You keep writing books and I'll keep reading them and figuring out what we can talk about next. Okay, I'll do it. Okay. Take care now. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. My guest today was Dr. Thomas Brown, who I think of as one of the preeminent uh, thinkers and uh, people in the field of ADHD. And as you've heard many others, psychological problems as well. Um, he's written a number of books. And what I think is unique about his books is that each one builds upon the other. So you could read, you could read them all in order, or you could read the latest one, for instance, outside the box, where he really dissects all the aspects of ADHD. And those are culmination of his thoughts over a number of years. Um, so I, I just think he's a, a great um, person to uh, be aware of as far as his uh, expertise. 
and uh, I hope you have a chance to uh, see and read some of his books, check out some of his webinars on Attitude Magazine or ADDA, or even on uh, YouTube. So thanks for joining me. I appreciate you being here and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.